session. Feel free to type your questions into the chat box at any point during the presentation. We'll copy them into a separate box for the presenters to view them more easily during the Q&A time. All right, so let's dive in with the lightning talks, and I'll pass things over first to Kathy O'Regan from the Bay Area Video Coalition. Hello, Wayne, and everybody. How are you? Okay, so my name's Kathy. I am the Preservation Manager here at the Bay Area Video Coalition in sunny San Francisco. <laughs> okay, so the Bay Area Video Coalition, uh, better known as BayVac, has been operating in the Bay Area for over 40 years. BAVAC is a non-profit institution that serves as a community hub for all those interested in media arts. At BAVAC, we focus on education, content creation, and video preservation. Open to the public, we are proud to be an inclusive, diverse, welcoming, and safe environment in the heart of San Francisco. Preservation is one of the oldest departments at BAVAC. Every tape we transfer is fully monitored by a trained preservation technician. Because we are dedicated to keeping pace with archival and preservation best practices, our staff are trained in moving image archiving and library and information sciences. An entirely non-profit department, our focus is on the individual needs of clients and their collections, and the expansion of progress in the field of audiovisual archiving. The preservation department has been a leader in the field of analog video preservation since its founding in 1994. In those 23 years, we have preserved thousands of hours of culturally significant and community-based audio and video content. So I wanted to tell you a little about our preservation team. Our staff is a small but endlessly dedicated team of trained audiovisual preservation professionals. We currently have three full-time staff members, two contracted preservation technicians, and one on-call equipment technician, much needed in the world of obsolescent media. Our working process comes from a place of strong AV preservation and technical expertise with an intense dedication to upholding archival best practices at all times. So what services do we provide? Well, obviously, first and foremost, we digitize tapes. We have the capacity to work with a wide range of video and audio tapes, both analog and digital. We provide a collection assessment service for collections of varying size. We also offer tape cleaning and baking services. We are also always available to answer questions. This is not a fee-for-service element of our department, but our field is constantly changing, and we believe strongly in the free and fruitful sharing of information between institutions and individuals, both within the AV archiving field and with those outside of it, particularly in the broader archival community. So uh, we also believe that one of the keys to our success as a preservation facility is having trained archivists on staff. Staff members steeped in archival best practices and with a keen and vested interest in keeping pace with ever morphing standards in the field help to ensure a consistent rate of quality in both management of archival materials and creation of digital content. We are also constantly expanding our use of open source applications, most particularly FFmpeg, in our continued effort to rely less on proprietary software. Our focus is and must be on longevity of both the tapes we digitize and the digital files we create. A consistent movement away from proprietary codecs and software can help to safeguard the validity of our files moving forward. Another absolute key to our success is maintenance of legacy equipment. Without equipment working in peak order, image quality quickly degrades, and with it the quality of files we can provide our clients. BAVAC works with two dedicated and experienced maintenance technicians on repairs and improvements on our equipment. We also have an on-call technician who conducts minor repairs that we cannot complete ourselves. We use a wide variety of time-based correctors, making individual analyses of each tape and collection we work with to assess which TBC will ensure the finest image quality attainable. Each tape we transfer is first assessed through use of both analog and digital scopes. Each of these elements are integral to our digitization process. So, what about your RFP? My first two points are intrinsically linked, clarity and specificity. Be as clear as possible about your intended outcome while being as specific as possible about your needs. While your vendor will be able to help you with certain questions as your project progresses, it is important that you have hashed out all key details and needs before drafting your RFP. Tape selection itself requires careful thought. Prioritization can be a struggle. It is tempting to put your most interesting and sought-after content to the top of the queue, and while this focus is not without merit, there are aspects which must be taken into consideration. While magnetic media is facing obsolescence across the board, there are formats that are actively deteriorating at a rate faster than others. This fact should be considered when making your selection. So, how can you help your vendor once you have selected your vendor? I can't recommend highly enough that you sustain an open line of communication with your primary contact at your vendor at all times. Too often mistakes are made simply due to lack of information. Ask questions. If there's an element of your project you're unsure of or concerned about, voice those concerns. You are outsourcing to avail of your vendor's set of expertise. Don't be afraid to avail of it. 
I would also recommend requesting examples of your vendor's work before beginning a large project in earnest. It would be incredibly frustrating to receive your first batch of files, only to realise that a small oversight renders them incompatible with your larger collection. Do be aware that your vendor wants to help you. Bayback Small, dedicated staff of archivists, technicians and librarians genuinely want to answer your questions and assuage your fears. Because we are a small, tight-knit operation, we provide friendly, informal, though very efficient, client services. We have an extensive history of partnering with institutions and individuals to apply for funding. Our department staff have various levels of experience in grant writing for audiovisual collections and projects, while also working closely with our development departments on all proposals. We are always on hand by email or by phone to give our clients, prospective clients, or simply inquisitive individuals information and advice. AVAC Preservation also plays an active role in development within the audiovisual archiving community. We have developed a number of free open source tools for use in archival settings. QC tools, in tandem with Signal Server, offer quality control analysis tools for assessing digital files, with a particular focus on files derived from videotape. AV Compass is an accessible and easy to use cataloging tool aimed at individuals and smaller non-AV focused institutions. It also features a variety of videos and information introducing the novice to AV preservation. AV Artifact Atlas is a community generated directory of examples of video and audio problems occurring in video. Here's my list of resources. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say that Bayback Preservation is proud to be consistently focused on the future while actively preserving the past. Thank you very much. All right, it looks like I'm up next. Um, greetings from the Media Preserve in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, my name is Diana, and I run the film department here. Uh, we're a full-service audiovisual preservation lab, as the name implies. But today, I'm going to focus briefly on film, since that's my area of expertise. If you have film in your collections, you're likely to have these gauges, which were common amateur and production formats uh, mostly in the 20th century, into the 21st century. If you have 16 millimeter or 35 millimeter, you might have negatives, soundtracks, and other preprint elements in addition to projection positives, which um, are the most common things that you'll find in film collections. And it's less likely, but you might also have some of these more unusual formats. Uh, and of course, by format, I mean gauge or um, the width of the film. So I'll go over our basic workflow for film at the Media Preserve. Um, all, th all vendors do things a bit differently from each other, but the basics should be similar from shop to shop. So a film arrives uh, at our facility and is checked into the system, given a barcode. Um, a basic look over and uh, photographed for metadata purposes. I'll go over the next four items in a little more detail, um, but I can tell you that films are inspected and repaired, uh, cleaned either on a machine or by hand, scanned on one of various scanners, and then um, some post-production is usually done to create uh, the best master file. QC, quality control, is performed using um, both digital automatic tools and uh, manually uh, using eyes and ears. Files are transcoded to make your derivative files that you might want. And then a, del a deliverable package is built to your specifications, including metadata, and delivered to you. We'll talk a bit about the equipment and methods we employ at the Media Preserve. Every film is inspected on a rewind bench from head to tail, leader is added, damage is assessed, repairs are made, and observations are recorded, both for our use while working with the film and for metadata that is delivered to the client. We wind all films onto archival cores, and if there's a need, or desire, we can recan films into vented polypropylene containers. Uh, we use, generally use steel design products. Most 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter films can be cleaned ultrasonically using uh, environmentally friendly 
uh, HFE 8200, which is um, a, a film cleaning solvent. Um, other gauges of film and delicate film can be cleaned by hand if possible, usually using the same solvent. Scanning equipment is chosen based on the film's gauge and condition and desired output resolution. Uh, this is a flash transfer, which can digitize 16 millimeter and associated soundtracks. Um, this Blackmagic Sintel scanner is a relatively new acquisition for us and can digitize both 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter. And then this uh, photo shows a Kineta scanner, which can handle almost any type of film and is very gentle uh, with shrunken and delicate or damaged assets. Most files require some post-processing um, after the film is scanned, but the degree of intervention is minimal and only intended to reproduce the experience of viewing the film on a projector. We primarily use Blackmagic DaVinci Resolve software for color correction and associated processes. Uh, these process, processes can include cropping, since most scanners capture information outside of the frame area. Sometimes this information is useful to hold on to as well in a master file. Color correction is usually necessary, but again, at a minimal level, uh, although some faded films require a bit more color correction to counteract the dye fading that can happen over time. Uh, we can also perform speed adjustments stabilization, things of that nature at this stage. Uh, but of course, the media preserve reformats more than just film, and magnetic media can be digitized at a higher volume than film generally can. This is a typical audio studio containing multiple quarter-inch studer decks for open reel audio tape, and Tascam cassette decks, as well as turntables, wire recorders, and other playback equipment. And this video studio contains eight each of VHS, Ematic, and Beta SP decks to allow parallel transfer. Um, and we can move in other types of play, playback decks to uh, achieve that multiple digitization. Um, of course, other video formats and audio formats um, do require one-to-one -one, uh, transfer, uh, things like two-inch quad video, for example. So there's certainly a lot to talk about in terms of what happens after the engineers create the master files, but it's not going to fit in this lightning talk. Uh, so I'm happy to answer questions um, either here or outside the webinar about things like checksums, um, quality control, derivatives, metadata, and um, the deliverable package. Thank you very much. Hello, this is Jan from Memnon. Can everyone hear me? Great. Thank you for joining me. Well, uh, Memnon Archiving Services um, is new in the North American market. We've been in Bloomington, Indiana since 2015, but we've got roots in Europe and uh, the rest of the world. We specialize in a range of services that will digitize, restore, preserve, and provide access to audiovisual heritage. We have a unique workflow system that ensures quality, while still allowing large volumes of materials to be digitized. And we have over 20 years, nearly 20 years of experience working with uh, different audiovisual technologies and clients um, throughout uh, Europe, North America, Africa, and the Middle East. In 2015, we were acquired by Sony, and that has its benefits. We now have access to lots of uh, equipment and technical expertise, and of course, the great backing of the brand name of Sony. I'm going to run through these slides quickly. These are just to be here for reference if you want to consult this presentation later. But again, our partnership with Sony really gives us uh, a lot of advantages and um, strengths in the market, um, considering a lot of the material was made on uh, Sony machines in the past. Um, we do have uh, locations around the world, including on-site projects. If a project is big, we'll go and uh, set up a shop there. We're doing that now in South Africa, and we're just finishing a project in Qatar. 
We've done lots of clients um, up to 25, over 2.5 million hours and over 5 million carriers of content have been preserved to date. You recognize some of these clients like the BBC, the United Nations, the International Olympic Committee, and of course our cornerstone project here in the United States is with Indiana University. Our facility here in Bloomington is in the Innovation Center on the campus of Indiana University. We've completely remodeled the space when we moved in in 2015, and let's just say it's very teched out. And our studios are designed uh, to um, accommodate different formats based on what clients need. Our cornerstone project here is the Media Digitization and Preservation Initiative from Indiana University. Um, it's a five-year project to complete over 280,000 various AV media carriers plus 25,000 reels of film. And we'll be done with all this by 2020. Uh, to date, uh, the MDPI website tracks how many items we've finished and we're uh, about at 216,723 items with film starting up in July. Formats, oh, this slide got a little wonky. Um, but um, we do a range of formats, and we really can uh, add more as they're needed. And with our partners at uh, MDPI, um, that even expands our expertise, and we're able to handle things that really need extra care or rare, like wire recording. And then we typically de uh, deliver a file package back to people that includes a preservation master, a mezzanine, an access file. Those all have embedded metadata, plus we'll give you uh, the XML and any um, quality control files you need. And in the case of video, we do use the Bay Area Video Coalition's QC tools. So um, as far as what is the right process for your media, well, we choose that based on what we learned about your collection. And this was a question that's come up before. Is how do I know if I want a, a unitary process or a parallel process? We've kind of broken that down here for some examples of when you might do that. So a unitary process is going to be something that uh, just will not fit with a multiple ingest because one, it's complex, uh, like two-inch plot or film scanning or things that are in bad condition. Um, if the tapes are very short, we're also with uh, 78. 78s are really short, and um, there's a lot of work that goes into getting one just right. So those would all be done one at a time. What we call low parallel process will be three to six. Um, uh, media being digitized by one engineer. Um, good quality quarter inch tapes, um, when we know that their standardized uh, speed and track configurations are all the same in that batch, we can do those. We do those four at a time with one operator. And uh, video cassettes like Umatic, we can do those. We do those six to eight at a time, depending on their condition. And then there's, there's the high parallel processes, and these can be 8 to 32, and then uh, on some huge projects, there's even uh, robots involved here. Um, but that are good for that, um, average to good quality audio cassettes and uh, good quality videotapes like Beta SP and VHS. Um, I won't bore you with our whole workflow here, but what I want to point out is, is, is our tool sets. We have a lot of proprietary software and programs that all work together to really make our systems very efficient. And that's what's pointed out there um, on the right, um, what we call our PAM um, and our MIS and all these other um, different acronyms. But basically, it's, it's good software combined with people that really um, make the quality control possible. And that's what this slide kind of goes into. We have uh, five levels of quality control and quality assurance uh, happening all the time. But again, our real critical factor to success is having these automated processes, but also having the human uh, quality control happening uh, at every step along the way as we prepare and digitize and finally deliver the files. So just real quick, just so you see, what does this look like when you're doing parallel transfer? I took Groove Media because that's kind of the sexiest looking media. Everybody loves records. Um, and so when we get... Um, Materials and what we do because of the size um, of uh, groups media, like uh, the albums here, um, we receive them, we check them in, give them a visual inspection, and uh, we put them in this little cart you'll see on the left there uh, with a card that has their barcode, and, and then the tapes, uh, I'm sorry, the, the discs are, are carefully handled through the process. Um, if they're, they pass their first visual inspection, then we go to our uh, cleaning method, and everybody, this is pretty much everybody's favorite room here, at Memnon, um, we have this ultrasonic cleaning 
um, that allows you to do lots of records at once. It looks really cool. It works really well. And all this happens um, before they're um, digitized to make sure we get the best transfer. So during this step, get another visual inspection, make sure it can hold up to the uh, cleaning. Um, it's all tracked within our system. There's notes made about the condition, and it's noted that it's getting cleaned. Um, and then uh, the parallel transfer uh, for uh, Groove's Media. We typically do four digitization workstations. You can see what that looks like in a room. And then, um, again, the key here is we have multiple levels of quality assurance and control, combining human QC with automated and semi-automated QC procedures. So there's lots more to get into, and I'd be happy to discuss that further with anyone who has more questions. Please reach out to us. Um, we can answer questions at the end, too, um, but we're happy to help you figure out how to evaluate your media, discuss best practices, and provide those quotes. We're also going to be at some conferences coming up uh, for the rest of the year, and that's a great time to connect and, and uh, learn more about us, and we can learn more about your collection. Thank you. Hi, can everyone hear me? OK, great. Thank you. So thanks for joining us, everyone. My name is Bryce Rowe. I'm the manager of audio preservation services at Northeast Document Conservation Center. So a little bit of background um, about NEDCC, because the name is a little bit deceiving. I'm going to be talking about our audio preservation services. Um, and, uh, but when we first formed, we were focused on paper um, and book conservation back in 1973. We were the first independent conservation lab in the US to specialize um, in conservation and preservation of paper and film-based collections. Um, however, we have expanded greatly, both in the kinds of preservation services that we offer um, and um, regional, and uh, uh, we are no longer just regional, as the name suggests. Um, we welcome clients from across the United States and um, and across the pond, and um, we've had clients from all over. Um, and since you know, um, moving on from our focus on just paper and and book formats, we have expanded to do imaging services, um, so high quality digital imaging. Um, and then in 2014, we added audio preservation to the list of services, which is what I'm going to focus on today. Um, but we also have a preservation services department, um, which kind of can help um, clients, um, archivists, librarians, uh, you know, answer questions leading up to the digitization process here. Um, so collection assessments, um, sort of uh, identifying maybe of grant for you, whether it's a planning grant or an implementation grant and things like that. Um, and we offer those resources for, um, for all kinds of collections and for all kinds of institutions. But to focus on our audio preservation, uh, which as I mentioned launched initially in 2014 when we added um, the IRENE service, which I'm going to talk about more. Um, uh, but in addition to digitization, we're a conservation center, as I mentioned, so um, we have some conservation and preservation services as well, and they're kind of that ethos is kind of folded into everything that we do. Um, so um, we do, in addition to digitization or before digitization, uh, we may clean materials if required. Um, we offer rehousing, some certain levels of repair. We can do digital imaging and conservation of original paper-based containers and related materials. And as I mentioned, consulting, so collection and item level assessment of your audio holdings, your audio carriers. We also offer a lot of workshops, web webinars, preservation leaflets, um, free resources on our website. So welcome to check, welcome you to check all of those out. And um, digitization and reformatting, which is what I will focus on. So this is just an overview of the service of the formats that we reformat. Uh, magnetic and optical audio, so quarter-inch open reel tape, compact cassette, DATs, and CDs. And then um, Irene is for grooved media, um, primarily damaged or really fragile grooved media, so lacquer discs, wax cylinders, 
um, tin foil even, as well as other rare formats. And then we do offer a stylus transfer service for discs that are um, intact and in, and in uh, good shape. Um, but the Irene is primarily for, you know, damaged, fragile media, and I'm going to talk about that next. So Irene, the slide's a little wonky there, um, <laughs> but uh, Irene um, is, uh, was implemented here in 2014. It's actually an acronym that stands for Image, Reconstruct, Erase, Noise, etc., and was so named because the first sound retrieved from the system during its development was a recording of Goodnight Irene by the Weavers. Um, but it's the, it's the culmination of decades of research um, uh, at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in the Library of Congress, and it uses a non-contact approach, um, an optical scanning approach, uh, to retrieve audio from grooved media, so it eliminates the possibility of damage caused by mechanical contact of a stylus on fragile media. Um, the process creates an ultra-high re resolution image um, of the audio groove structures, and then those image files are then processed through a software that translates them into an audio file. Um, if properly cared for, the image files themselves can serve as a digital surrogate of the physical object. That photo in the middle there, surrounding or in the center of all of the um, carriers that it's surrounded by, is, an, is a that's an image of the um, uh, an example image of the grooves um, on a disc that's then translated through our software and turned into audio. Um, so it's especially good for, like I said, damaged or especially fragile media because there's no contact with the stylus. And then uh, we, in addition to the audio files that we deliver, um, we deliver the, the high resolution TIFF images as well. Um, so as I mentioned, um, kind of a di digital surrogate of the phys physical object in its current state. Um, you know, as at the time of the scanning, uh, as the object continues to physically degrade over time, you have that high resolution image. And then based on the success of Irene, NEVC's clients began asking us to expand into audio preservation of magnetic tape with a similar um, sort of niche focus uh, where we would be focusing on, you know, unique collections where the stakes were high by doing a one-to-one -one fully attended transfer for all of our projects. So um, the idea is that, um, again, one audio engineer listening to the entire project as it's being, or listening to each tape as it's being digitized from start to finish. The image here is of one of our audio engineers, Carl, in one of our new control rooms. Um, and that allows us to deliver 100% quality control. We're listening to the whole thing. We can catch any errors as it's actually being played back. We can document those errors um, while we're listening, or we can document anything that you know might sound funny so that when you get them back and you hear something weird, you know that it was intrinsic to the recording and not an artifact of the transfer process. Um, and um, the workflow also includes strict adherence to IASA, International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives standards, SAGI, um, we'll talk about some of these more a little bit later. Um, but also a conservation-minded approach, as I mentioned, um, so strict adherence to AIC, American Institute of Conservation Code of Ethics and Guidelines for Practice, which basically means we are informing clients in writing of exactly how we propose to clean any media, um, using only vetted techniques, techniques in everything that we do, um, never treating information as proprietary, and then uh, disclosing all of the, that information in your proposal so that um, it's a fully informed consent. And then anything we run into that, that varies from that um, is uh, followed up with thorough communication and documentation. It also means we can accommodate most special metadata requests, um, but uh, if you have questions about that, just reach out. We don't have to go over all those details. 
and just some good candidates for a one-to-one -one fully attempted transfer with us. Um, again, important questions where the stakes are high, um, where uh, you know, you, need, you want somebody listening to the whole thing as it's being done, if they're fragile, um, and, uh, you know, the audio engineer is going to catch that as they're listening um, and mitigate any, any issues um, right away. Um, similarly, fragile collections that are too risky, risky to be transferred unattended. And then, again, because we are delivering 100% quality control, uh, it's a good service for clients who do not have the time or staffing to completely listen to all of your deliverables and perform you know, a quality control check when, when you've received the deliverables. And finally, how to approach us, a little bit about what we need to put together a detailed proposal. Um, just call or email. Proposals are a consultation. They're not a price matrix. Um, it's going to be kind of custom, custom fit to your needs. Um, physical examination of carriers is ideal. We have secure climate controlled storage, no fees for storage, and packing and shipping tips on the website. But we can also work with photos. And then we'll go over this a little bit more later, I believe, but um, a basic inventory at the very least are some summary statistics. And we can provide you with a template um, to help you estimate the cost. And um, you can also just go to our website, which is very detailed as well, about audio and working with audio preservation. It's going to tell you a lot more about how to prepare your materials to be delivered here, um, as well as outline um, everything you can expect to see in a proposal, uh, including your deliverables. Uh, we also have some funding opportunities there as well. And that's it. My email address is there, and phone number as well as our Twitter account. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for all these presentations. They were very informative. Now we'll switch gears a little bit to the moderated discussion. During this section, we'll be covering certain aspects of the audiovisual digitization outsourcing that can be stressful or even intimidating for professionals who lack specialized training. In fact, the topics here are based on community feedback collected via the survey that was linked in the announcement for this series. We've tried to organize the topics loosely in chronological order for the digitization workflow. Also, we've realized that it's very easily easy to inadvertently transition from a kind of a helpful information resource to an information overload when there are multiple speakers providing varied input. Uh, to help with this a little bit, I'll be providing a basic response to each topic and occasionally point to outside resources, and then allow the speakers to go more in-depth, providing examples, counterpoints, and even delving into the details that pertain to a specific media types. A great way to think of this is the need-to-know versus nice-to-know dichotomy. What information is required to get a project moving, and what information can be obtained a little bit later. So our first question is, what type of information is required when I first reach out to a service provider? There are a few things to keep in mind in the need-to-know information. First. What, know what kind of format types you have, including the information on brands if possible. The number of items in the estimated hours of content are also very important for estimating costs. Of course, it can be difficult to know how many hours of content you have, particularly when you lack the equipment to play the recordings, or if they just can't safely be played. It's okay to give estimates or just give item counts in these cases. Overall condition is also important to know because many maybe there are cons conservation issues that need to be addressed prior to digitization. Also, the condition of your carriers along with the types may impact what services you'd like to go for. Parallel transfer refers to a technician digitizing multiple recordings simultaneously while one-to-one -one transfer is, as you might have guessed, a slightly more boutique approach, oftentimes having technicians work with items that have unique conservation needs. As I mentioned earlier, the details of your project will determine what service is more appropriate. Our speakers will be able to provide some more details in a moment. The deliverables refers to the product you are expecting to receive from the service provider. What types of digital files do you want and, and what are the con conservation specifications? This is where it's vital that you've done your homework. 
We have provided some useful links at the bottom and at the end of this presentation that will direct you to establish guidelines for different types of materials. Of course, the Digital Libraries Federation's wiki content on digitizing special formats at wiki.digla.org is another great place to ha find helpful resources. Finally, photos of the materials, their containers, and storage environment can be great for, a great aid for, re for service providers when it comes to assessing your collection. So with that brief rundown of the need to know, I'll turn it over to our speakers to comment on additional useful information to get your project off the ground. Would anybody like to kick this off? And from Bemnon, um, I will say this is, you know, the basics that we need to know. Any additional information is is helpful. There's uh, what we say the uh, the basics, and then more of the uh, platinum standard as far as information. Some of this too uh, can be derived from looking at some of the guides that are available online as well. If you're not sure, um, like some of the tape stock and brands, um, you might find average links for some of the materials too, and that can also kind of help you. So if you don't have a lot of information, um, oftentimes there's a little bit of research you can do, and a lot of these resources are linked on the DFL um, uh, wiki already about digitizing formats. And then um, rely on the expertise of your vendor. Uh, call us, talk to us, and um, we can help you work through specifics. Um, especially per format, there could be extra issues. For example, um, the photos are so helpful for something like quarter-inch tape because if there's a lot of splices and maybe the glue's gone bad, um, that's an indication that it's going to need a lot of attention and, and repair. Uh, things like that are really uh, kind of important when you're when you're talking about pricing. Great. Thank you so much. I am noticing that we're running just a little bit behind, so if it's okay, I'd, I'd like to move on to the, the next question that we have here, which is, what advice can you give regarding seeking out and identifying the most qualified service provider? I'll, I'll leave this one pretty much to our speakers, but provide a bit of framing information. The current best practice is to look at three different service provider proposals and touching on something I've discussed in previous in the previous question, there are, is some unavoidable homework that you'll need to do. So be sure to tech, check out the links at the bottom of the screen and at the end of this presentation to look at the various digitization guidelines. You'll need to know what you're looking at for when it comes to the conversion specifications of preservation masters, for instance. So what do you think? Is there advice that you can offer, perhaps resources to consult, or perhaps there are aspects of the proposal that can be easily overlooked or misinterpreted? Uh, this is Diana at the media program. Uh, I was just going to reiterate what oh, sorry, Kathy ahead. said in her presentation about asking for a sample. Um, your vendor should be able to provide a short sample, uh, ideally of, of something that you have in your collection, um, to confirm that the transfer is done properly and that the uh, uh, files meet your specification. Um, and I would also uh, speak to your vendor about getting a reference list. Um, he should be able to provide you the names of some um, similar sized institutions or similar collections that they worked on in the past so that you can actually get a first-hand account of how, how that job went previously. Um, and I'll add to that quickly. Um, Storage and security specifications, um, they should be able to provide uh, that information to you as well so you know that while your items are on site, they're being cared for and um, are in, in safe, secure storage. Um, and this is kind of broad, but I think just transparency, um, they should be able to you know, fully disclose how, how they're treating the materials and, um, and what goes into their process, which I think you know, we've, we've demonstrated. Um, in this presentation, but uh, you shouldn't be afraid to ask because uh, chances are, you know. Great. Thank you so sure. much. Uh, this next question defies what I said earlier about these questions being in chronological order. This is truly something that needs to be considered in the early planning stages, but I didn't really want to start a discussion with this one. So here we are now. 
what kind of infrastructure should my institution have in place before we seriously consider digitization of AV assets? Is there a minim minimum viable digitization preservation plan? So this topic can easily have its own webinar series, so I'm just going to go touch on some of the broad ideas regarding some of the need-to-know items. There are many available online resources from organizations such as Digital Power or ICI Guidelines chapter on the small-scale approaches to digital storage systems. And again, those are all linked over on the left-hand side in the links. However, I will use one example to help, we, to help quickly illustrate some basic points. The example is the National Digital Stewardship Alliance's Levels of Digital Preservation. For those unfamiliar with this chart, the NDSA levels are a set of recommendations for different aspects of an institution's digital preservation plan. The aspects are storage, file fixity, security, metadata, and file formats. There are four tiers or levels for each aspect. The higher you go, the more solid your plan is. Being at or on your way to a solid level one is going to have you ready for working with your service providers on AV digitization. Let me point out two aspects in relation to working with a service provider. Storage. The service provider will send the deliverables back to your institution on a hard drive. You will need to at least be able to get the data off into an archival storage system that is backed up on a regular basis. For instance, maybe you have a digital collections repository at your university or your university has a storage system that is backed up regularly it's important to get your data there as quickly as possible. Also, fixity. The service provider will likely be giving you checksums along with the other technical metadata, so you need a way to check to make sure that these files are ingested into your storage system. Along the same lines, you will need to have someone able to perform quality assurance with the deliverables. Thankfully, working with the service providers helps some of it, make some of this easier such as having control over what file formats are being ingested and getting appropriate technical metadata. So I don't have time to go into further detail. There are so many other things to be discussed, such as partnering with organizations in order to cope with limited funding or picking up good tools for your workflow. Perhaps we will touch on these topics during the Q&A discussion. All right. Do our speakers have any further starts? thoughts or recommendations regarding a minimal viable digitization preservation plan for AV materials? This is Jan from Memnon, and I would just say don't let this scare you from going ahead with digitization because there are lots of people are, are, are at different spots with this. You know, and, um, you know, sometimes you can develop it on the fly. For instance, if you don't have one, maybe this process of writing the clear grants is going to be your first outline of a digital preservation plan. Um, in the worst case scenario, um, you could, you know, um, get things digitized and store it on hard drives and then maybe put some up in the cloud. I mean, there's all kinds of options to help you get it done. But a key thing here is that some of this media, especially the magnetic media, it doesn't have time to wait for your organization to go through a multi-year planning process. Um, the need is really there to get it done. So I would say um, if you have resources to digitize, get started. Um, you can figure out uh, how to keep those uh, digital assets safe in the short term while you work on your longer term plans. Great. Thank you so much for that. We've got one more uh, discussion question. Uh, what are some strategies or important things to consider when preparing materials to go to a service provider for digitization? Here, the need to know is pretty straightforward. A complete manifest in the form of a spreadsheet is essential. That said, I'm sure that the speakers can provide much more information based on their experience, so I'll open the floor up to them. Um, I'll, I'll pipe in because we, this is Bryce from NEDCC, uh, because we deal especially with the Irene clients, we often have really fragile media, really fragile disks, um, you know, cracked or broken disks. 
um, or cylinders shipped here. So um, packaging, um, we have some information on our website, but we can also make custom enclosures. Uh, but more so, if you have any concerns about shipping your items anywhere, um, you know, in our case, you can reach out to our registrar, and they can give you some guidance. Um, and I, you know, I'm sure other vendors can pipe in. Um, but uh, you know, just consider the fragility um, and safe packaging. And then the other quick recommendation on that, in that regard, is um, if you can, choosing you know an overnight or two-day expedited option to limit the amount of time that the materials are in transit. Um, not every collection needs maybe a fine arts handler, although that's an option as well. Um, but if you can at least do some sort of expedited shipping. So and I will briefly say this is Jan from Memnon. Um, you might consider how these materials are going to be stored when you get them back. Uh, sometimes our clients like to use um, nice um, plastic bins that then the items will go back into and uh, will be ready for long-term storage in those versus using uh, a cardboard container of sorts. And uh, I will note for the wax cylinders, um, Indiana University, who uh, we work with quite often, um, they've taken to using insulated pizza delivery bags to make sure that their cylinders are temperature controlled. So there's all uh, kinds of ways to uh, get creative and make sure your materials are going to be safe during transport. Um, this is Kathy at Bayback. I do just want to say as well, it's just important to let your vendor know if there are any serious um, issues with your tapes. Like, for example, we can't do mold remediation here. So if, say, if there's mold issues with your collection you would, and you were dealing with us, you would need to send that out for treatment previous to sending it to us. And again, that's you know a cost-saving issue as well. So just be aware of any serious problems with your, your tapes or your materials that maybe can't be treated by a vendor. Yeah, I would echo the communication uh, idea. This is Diana from the Media Preserve. Um, your your vendors should know what they're going to get before they get it. Um, in the case of film, uh, for example, nitrate film is flammable and needs to be shipped in a very specific way. So you want to make sure um, to know what to expect in terms of shipping. Um, I would also suggest that uh, even if you, if your institution has a lot of um, cleaning or handling equipment, uh, to let the vendor do any prep, cleaning, incubating, um, things like that, uh, because they will do those things um, only to the degree needed to make a transfer. Um, so sometimes those things can be very specific. Great. Thank you all for that. All right, before we start our Q&A session, I'd like to point out the contact information for all of the presenters today. They're happy to answer any further questions that you have via email. Also, if you need to leave the session a little early, we will be posting a recording online very soon. You will be able to find the information on the same page that led you here, as well as the DLF Digitizing Special Formats Wiki. We'll start going through the questions that you've already posted in the chat box. Go ahead and continue to ask your questions in the chat, and we will move them over to the Q&A window for the presenters to actually answer. I gave you a disk, but I didn't put it in. Um, that's what you checked it to see if uh, I see Tammy G is asking a question. Um, certainly original metal cans, if they're in good condition, are excellent for shipping film. Um, you can put bubble wrap or acid-free tissue paper inside the can to cushion. Um, archival boxes, if they're sturdy, uh, are also okay. It's a good idea to put a lot of padding on the outside of the container as well. Um, we offer, for shipping material, we offer um, waterproof plastic totes that we can send to customers uh, and then they can ship them back in those containers. So that's certainly our suggested method of shipping. And yes, we transfer magnetic film soundtracks.
All right, it looks like a few more folks are typing some questions. So what I thought I would do is just um, uh, kind of bring things to a close. And thank you all for joining our first webinar in the Strategies for Audiovisual Digitization Project series. I'd like to quickly point out that next week we'll be having the second and final webinar of the series, Low-Cost, DIY, and Community-Based Approaches to Audiovisual Digitization. This presentation will feature representatives from the DCPL Memory Lab, XFR Collection, University of Wisconsin-Madison's Proud and Pravda Projects, and California Audiovisual Preservation Project. You can attend the session by returning to the same link that brought you here. It's scheduled for Wednesday, June 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern. And again, thank you everyone for uh, joining us here today. Uh, taking some time out of your day, and, and particularly the presenters who have, have provided us with so much great content. I'll just jump in. I see a couple of questions up there, and I'll answer a few that I can. Um, the uh, Trent's question about uh, descriptive metadata records and, and technical metadata, um, as far as uh, how Memnon works, yes, those are combined. Um, whatever metadata you want to go in that you already have, you give us at the beginning, and then that metadata um, is going to be included in those files, and then anything that we do um, in the digitization process will also appear then in the technical metadata, the type of machine that we used, even who the operator was on shift that uh, digitize that material, as well as notes about um, condition issues and things that we found, because part of our process is to faithfully reproduce the materials you give us. If you want improvements, um, we can do that after the fact, but we want you to know um, about anything that came up or that we saw about that media during the digitization process. Um, and then briefly for the magnetic AV format, um, from my perspective, um, right now it's UMATIC videotapes, um, DATs, audio DATs, and audio cassettes seem to be at the most risk, but uh, it's really uh, UMATIC and DATs that uh, we're seeing are in the worst condition these days. As for, as for magnetic media, that um, earlier formats are obviously in the most Poor conditions, particularly we work with a lot of half-inch open reel, which we have pretty consistent problems with. To the person who asked about um, are you asking about file formats or something else? Our operation is short. So uh, smaller, smaller models are handled in the same way. Sorry, is it still echoing?
All right. It looks like there's some some answers going on in the Q and A in the chat box. Um, again, I'd love to um, take this chance to thank our speakers for their time uh, and contributions, and everyone who joined us today for their participation, and of course the DLF for hosting this event. Um, I, uh, also, I'd like to mention that if you'd like to learn more about CLEAR or the Digital Library Federation, we've provided links in the pod on the left-hand side. Uh, and thank you, for, um, and we hope you have a wonderful day. And also, just one last reminder that if you have any questions, uh, be sure to contact the vendors by email, and they would be more than happy to get back to you. I, again, um, thank you so much for attending, and hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.